In this lecture, I want to talk about a simpler set of numbers designed to support something like infinitesimals or the naive or intuitive version of the calculus. In this case, it's the dual numbers. The dual numbers actually have a fairly simple definition. We'll call them D, and they're defined as all the pairs AB, given that A B are in our field of choice. Now that field could be the real numbers or our kind of pseudo approximation field, the machine double precision floating point numbers. Then our pairs of numbers typically written as A plus B epsilon, where epsilon is just a free symbol that tell, can allows us to tell the A position from the B position. In classic mathematics, Notations involving sums, formal sums that aren't actually evaluated, were preferred over vector or tuple notations. So these are basically considered synonyms for each other. Now, the arithmetic rules for these dual numbers are derived from their components. So if we want to add, it's just a plus c plus b plus d epsilon. Or in, again, in tuple notation, a plus c b plus d. It's just adding component-wise. Multiplication is we treat these as if they were formal sums, which is some, some of the convenience of using a plus notation. It makes it easy to remember and drive things. So the product would be ac plus ad plus bc epsilon plus bd epsilon squared. And then we're using the convention that epsilon squared goes to zero, which means epsilon squared, epsilon is the great sin that breaks, makes the dual numbers not a field. It's a quantity thought to not be zero whose square is zero. It's a zero divisor, so it is basically a major flaw preventing D from being a full field. But it lets us calculate quite nicely. It's behaving like an infinitesimal. The theory of an infinitesimal is always they're very small, smaller than any positive real number, and the square of them is even smaller than themselves, so much smaller you can ignore it. So we're actually just formalizing that. So really, the dual numbers are a vector space over our base field, be it the real numbers or the floating point numbers, and it has a multiplication rule, and the multiplication rule is that this tuple, times this tuple is this tuple. Nothing magic about using the epsilon notation. Under this interpretation, we can basically take derivatives easily. That f prime of x, again, is equal to f prime of x plus epsilon, sorry, f of x plus epsilon minus f of x over x plus epsilon minus x, which again, that is just epsilon. So we can compute derivatives directly. We don't have to take a limit as epsilon goes to zero. Epsilon is doing the accounting of being an infinitesimal all by itself. However, notice we're doing exactly what we said is a problem. We're dividing by a zero divisor. So we have to use an arithmetic convention that we try to clear these epsilons out as much as possible. Let's say f equals x squared and try it. So f of x plus epsilon is x plus epsilon squared minus x squared over epsilon. This is x squared plus 2x epsilon plus epsilon squared. These two cancel. And we get 2x epsilon over epsilon or 2x, once we just use the convention that epsilon over epsilon equals 1. So we have to add that as a convention. It's not implied by the arithmetic. And we get the right answer, that the x squared prime is 2x. We can define extensions of many simple functions like sin, cosine to be functions over this larger pseudo field, and then we can take the derivatives with respect to them. It's just a matter of using additive angle formulas and pushing the epsilons around. Now, why this is great is if you have this, you invent all of automatic differentiation, back propagation, uh, packages like TensorFlow, Keras, PyTorch. So this sort of algebra is enough 
to capture quite a lot about the gradient structure of functions, which is very useful. The reason this didn't take off classically is this is not how Newton and Leibniz treated the infinitesimals. They said they didn't believe the square of an infinitesimal was zero so much as it could be treated as zero. So they considered that a processing step. And Bishop uh, Berkeley very much criticized that. How can something both be zero and become zero? It's the remnant of a number not there. So they then said, okay, let's add some time control to the process, which is the limit notation. So you could tell when you were changing your treatment of the free symbol epsilon. And there were no advantages to having a number type epsilon having a free symbol and having this clunky limit notation showing when you're taking it out was actually to their advantage. Now, why are they concerned? If we're very careful and always push the epsilons out in the calculation, this epsilon squared equals zero tends not to interfere with this epsilon over epsilon equals one um, convention until it does. So what they're afraid of is what if we are calculating the derivative of a composition of functions? Well, by the chain rule, that is f prime of g of x. So this is an algebraic fact known to be true, an identity known to be true about derivatives. So again, if f of x equals g of x equals x squared, so we took one step symbolically. Now we'll plug in this, we'll take the derivative by plugging in our definition that it's x plus epsilon. So this would be x squared plus epsilon squared minus x squared squared over epsilon times x plus epsilon squared minus x squared over epsilon. That simplifies into 2x squared epsilon over epsilon times 2x epsilon over epsilon. If we are careful and clear the epsilons first, before combining these two fractions, before multiplying, then we get 4x to the third, which is the right answer. That is the derivative of x to the fourth. So if we do the calculation in the exact right order, we get the right answer. If, however, we, as is presumably allowed in the algebra of, an, of a field, multiply out the numerators and multiply out the denominators, then we get 2x to the third epsilon squared over epsilon squared. And our epsilons go to zero rule may kick in, and we'd get 2x to the third zero over zero, and we get a quantity we don't know the answer to. So the dual numbers working properly involves a very rigorous order of clearing that you try to clear out epsilons out of expressions in a very specific order. If you don't do it in that order, you get an invalid expression. That you, don't, you can't compute the value of 0 over 0 because in some sense you don't have the history of where each 0 came from. You no longer know that they were actually the exact same epsilon, so you don't have enough information to apply this clearing rule. This clearing rule is only true in certain situations, and you, if you, without enough tracking, you may not know what those situations are. And that is the dual numbers. And really, they are secretly used in a lot of packages, probably under a lot of different names. And the field now is called automatic differentiation. And it is responsible for the, it was rediscovered as backprop in neural nets. It's responsible for the very efficient calculation of very complicated gradient structures on very large functions, which lets us optimize over them. Thank you very much for your time.